Now, um, Jane referred to a stellar cast, and here's the first star. Richard Smith um, will now give uh, his uh, talk on John Graunt, The Law of Natural Decline and the Origins of Urban Historical Demography. I imagine he's known to all of you, as he's been to me, as uh, one of our most distinguished historical demographers, emeritus professor at the University of Cambridge, um, and, of course, greatly associated with the the work of the Cambridge Group for the History of Population and Social Studies, which has been, I think, I wouldn't say one of the most successful, that's a big claim to make, but one of the, the, the most successful, certainly, of all uh, pieces of economic and social history undertaken in the last 30 or 40 years. And it's very great to have Richard and, indeed, Tony Wrigley, uh, one of the founders of the group, here with us today. So, over to you, Richard. Well, as um, the late Nobel Prize winning Cambridge economist Sir Richard Stone put it in his magisterial set of Mattioli lectures that were delivered in 1986, but um, only published posthumously um, under the title of some British empiricists in the social sciences, 1650 to 1900, John Grant was virtually a one book man but his short book, um, Observations on the Bills of Mortality, published in 1662, many would argue marked a sea change in the use of statistics and in the derivation of a methodology that was recognizably demographic. In that sense, um, Johann Peter Susmilch, his reference to him as a Columbus in the role he performed seems very apt. Um, Susmich made that comment in 1741. And when giving his pioneering lectures in the 1920s and early 1930s, not a great distance from here up the road in Gower Street at University College London, um, Carl Pearson was in no doubt that John Grant had a very real claim to be regarded as the father of statistics. Be that as it may, the impact of the observations um, was such that Grant, very soon after its publication, was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society, thereby bringing him within the famous Gresham College group uh, that Roderick Flood has just um, um, mentioned had emerged um, a year or so um, earlier. The observations went into five editions by 1676 and quickly made an impact on his contemporaries in England, such as William Petty, and subsequently Edmund Halley, as well as we go across the um, North Sea and the Channel, the likes of Huygens, Stroik, and even Leibniz, just to name a few. And Grant's life history, his intellectual and personal relationships with William Petty, and a disproof of the older argument that William Petty was the actual author of the observations, are issues that have been powerfully pursued by the late David Glass in a classic paper um, actually presented um, at a tercentenary conference on Grant's work in the Royal Society in um, 1962. That's just 50 years ago. An interest in the work has been such that it's gone into various editions and reprints C.H. Hull, whose edition I will use in um, quotations today, in the late 1890s, F.W. Wilcox, another name that demographers will conjure up, 1939, and um, another reprint with a characteristic introduction by Peter Laslett in 1973. But Glass did more than most to describe and analyse the problems associated with Grant's tentative but subsequently very influential attempts to distribute deaths according to age, and thereby create the nearest thing um, to a life table. Ian Hacking has written elegantly in attempting to place Grant's work within the history of early ideas of probability. And Charles Webster, the doyen of early modern historians of science and medicine, was able to plant, uh, place Grant within that vast outpouring that flowed from the influence of Bacon's Instauratio Magna and the history of life and death, and linked to um, Webster's work 
in that weighty great inspiration book that came out in 1975 are his reflections um, or the reflections of Philip Krieger who's going to be talking um, later today who's thrown a great deal of, um, of light on Grant's methods by tracing them back to Bacon as well as relating his statistical techniques to common bookkeeping practices with which um, Grant would have been very familiar as a London haberdasher. And Krieger has gone some way further than most other historians have thought in explaining Grant's writings in terms of religious and mercantile ideas prevalent in the middle of the 17th century. One other more recent commentator is worthy of mention. I um, don't think he's here today. Given that Grant had a great deal to say about plague insofar as it had a prominent place among the attributed causes of death reported in the bills of mortality. And that scholar is Professor Paul Slack in Oxford, who in his magisterial work on the impact of plague in Tudor and Stuart England, approaches the subject from the perspective of a historical demographer, measuring the mortality impact and epidemic frequencies of plague, as well as that of a historian of thought, who is interested in the way that ideas about plague came to influence public policy, and in particular how plague, which in the early 17th century, one might say had been viewed as having primarily providential underpinnings, came to regard as having very distinctive attributes, predictable patterns, as a result of Grant's application um, of Baconian dissection of the plague information in the bills of mortality, and hence facilitating the acceptance um, or acceptability of policies taken to thwart, um, thwart plague's arrival and spread in England through the rise of quarantine, rather than um, a near exclusive reliance on prayer. As Slack notes, um, Grant made only one tentative reference to divine providence in the observations, and that was employed in order to discuss what he called old superstition about the timing of epidemics. Now, if time permitted, I could add significantly to a long and distinguished literature on the observations. And one can certainly go so far as to claim that the template of statistical analysis of demographic data was provided by Grant's observations. He offers us a way of engaging in critical analysis um, of the quality of data sets on which his calculations were based and establishes new standards in his consideration of mortality by cause of death as well as a demonstration of the stability of certain statistical ratios and through his efforts to construct a life table. But there's no time to go further into these matters which others have already considered in the literature most thoroughly. I want instead to focus on the issues raised by the urban context in which Grant largely sets his analysis and from which he derives his data. Certain sections of the observations retain significance of a high order in a set of ongoing debates about the role played by urban centres in influencing geographically larger demographic systems and about whether such centres um, had inherent qualities that are common to all pre-industrial urban settings. In chapter seven of the observations on what he calls the differences between burials and christenings, Grant offers the observation on the London bills that there were far more burials than christenings. For in 40 years, this quote, from the year 1603 to the year 1644, exclusive of both years, he says, there have been set down 363,000 935 burials and but 330,747 christenings within um, the various parishes that constituted, if you like, his, his analytical setting in London. And it goes on. From this single observation, it will follow that London should have decreased in its people. The contrary whereof we see by its daily increase of buildings upon new foundations and by the turning of great palatial houses into small tenements. It is therefore certain that London is supplied from people, with people from out of the country, whereby not only to supply the overplus differences of burials above mentioned, but likewise to increase its inhabitants according to the said increase of housing. And if you'll excuse me, 
the string of quotes to set the scene. He goes on, but if we consider what I have upon exact inquiry found true, be delicate, that in the country, within 90 years, there have been 6,339 6, christenings and 5,280 burials. The increase of London will be solved without inferring the decrease of the people in the country. Now, of course, he used just one rural sample, which happens to be the um, Hampshire parish of Romsey, which um, was, in fact, William Petty's birthplace, which has led to all kinds of, I think, spurious inferences, but that's beside the point. Grant goes on to make various estimates of population sizes of, of London and the country to support this relatively optimistic view of the capacity of non-metropolitan parishes or parish um, uh, non-metropolitan population growth to underwrite continued national population growth, notwithstanding the migration flows that he felt were absolutely necessary into London and also burials that were occurring um, outside of England of those emigrating to the colonies, of whom there were very large numbers by the late 17th century, um, or lost abroad as fatalities in military conflicts. Now, Grant probes further into the differences he detected between city and country, and attempts to show, and again to quote, why although in the country the christenings exceed the burials, yet in London they do not. The general reason for this must be that in London the proportion of those subject to die and to those capable of breeding is greater than in the country. Let there be a hundred persons in London and as many in the country. We say that if there be 60 of them breeders in London, there are more than 60 in the country. Or else, we must say, that London is more unhealthful, or that it inclines men and women more to barrenness than in the country. Now, he sets out why there were proportionately fewer breeders in London than in the country, since London received many men coming there, as he said, for reasons of justice and trade, who left their wives at home in the country, as did persons coming to London in search of pleasure or cures for ill health, and that many males were bound as apprentices um, and did so for seven to nine years when marriage was unavailable to them. And finally, as he put it, there were many uh, seamen in London who left their wives unable to breed without them, which might have encouraged promiscuity. Well, Grant does draw a distinction between the relative numbers at risk to breed um, in town and in country and the unhealthiness of the two settings. He notes that seasoned bodies, a very interesting concept here, um, may and do live near as long in London as elsewhere. Yet newcomers and children do not, for the smokes, stinks and close air are less healthful than of the country. A very, very important observation that uh, Grant is making at this, um, this sort of juncture. And it's this observation he feels is justified by what he sees as the tendency of sickly persons uh, to retreat to the country. And in reflecting on possible barrenness in London, he suggests that intemperance in feeding, and especially adulteries and fornications, are believed to be more frequent there and hindered breeding. And finally, he feels that minds of men in London um, those of you who obviously work here will like this particular comment, are more thoughtful and full of business and therefore subject to anxieties, whereas in the country, corporal labour and exercise promote breeding. Well, being very alert to the quality of the data with which he worked, a feature that was a hallmark of his approach, he did spend some time in reflecting on the accuracy of the christening record available to him. He ponders what he calls the neglect of Christianity, oh, sorry, of christenings, and believed that the account of christenings hath been neglected more than that of burials, for reason to do with religious opinion against the baptizing of infants that were particularly pronounced in the Commonwealth period between 1650 and 1660. He also refers to the scruples of ministers unwilling to baptize leading parents to take their offspring to those ministers who failed to or refuse to register the baptism. And also, he notes the disincentive arising from the need to pay a baptismal fee. Although he does conclude, and I quote, that upon the whole matter, it is most uncertain. And of course, he doesn't 
Consider whether the neglect of christenings was likely to have been greater in the city than in the countryside. Now, while the modern commentator may scoff at some of these attempts by Graunt to construct a causal account of contrast between town and country, we cannot avoid recognising that Graunt alighted in these parts of the observations uh, to which my attention has been drawn in my comments so far on a set of issues that form a core component of what is a central theme in present-day urban historical demography. To the extent that this issue was investigated at all, opinion could be seen as conforming to Grant's observations that there was indeed what um, the um, distinguished American economic historian, Jan de Vries, has called the law of urban natural decline or the law of, um, of natural decrease. Johann Peter Susmich, to whom I've referred already, extended Grant's um, interest in these matters, citing his evidence um, in the observations, but also um, alighting in part on calculations that Grant's near contemporary Gregory King had assembled in his mass of data to describe the state of England um, in 1695. Um, these figures are taken straight from um, Gregory King on the state of England in 1695. And um, Susmilch, having seen these, drew attention to the fact that London's crude death rate was slightly more than 41 per thousand, that of the um, lesser cities and market towns 33 per thousand, and villages the lowest death rate of all at 31 per thousand. This sort of paradigm that I think this little table captures um, was also central, of course, to William Farr, the great 19th century superintendent of statistics, of seeing this sort of urban handicap arising directly as a function of viewing mortality levels as positively related um, to population density. And you can go on, um, demographers here will, will know of Kingsley Davis, who as late as the um, early 1970s um, subscribed to the view um, that, um, that towns were effectively, um, for a very long time, places in which um, reproduction, so to speak, of the population was impossible without substantial influxes of, um, of migrants. And um, a kind of pioneering three-volume tome um, that um, marks really, in some respects, the very early days of historical demography in the 1950s by Roger Moll. Um, he assembled a vast amount of information relating to town populations um, and um, again invariably shows there to be a burial surplus as opposed to a baptismal surplus in um, uh, the communities that he, he brought together in this um, collection of data in the 17th and 18th centuries. In fact, there was a deeply embedded tendency to view city mortality as so high that whatever the fertility level operating, cities were unable to replace themselves without significant um, migration flows. And of course, the classic account was presented by Tony Wrigley in 1967. We should soon be celebrating the 50th anniversary of that paper um, um, because of its significance. When he demonstrated that because of London's rapid growth, in the 17th century, against a background, you might say a la Grant, in which burials significantly exceeded baptisms, migration flows were such that perhaps by 1700, London required an annual inflow of 8,000 migrants to sustain the striking growth in its size that was occurring, and that perhaps as much as one sixth of all those who'd survived into adulthood um, had to be decanted, so to speak, into London in order to um, make up that difference between um, births and deaths. And the conceptual depth of the notion of natural decline um, in urban centres can be seen in what I, as a geographer in those days, always found a very intriguing little diagram um, that appeared in Tony Wrigley's Population and History that was published in 69, 1969, showing the, um, the kind of negative, um, um, if you like, growth patterns associated with a large urban center, a so-called seaport, and again, the, the, the contours rising again and then dropping down to um, a small market town. This is, in a sense, I think, symptomatic or emblematic, really, of um, um, a Grantian way of thinking. In 1978, the first real objection to the sort of idea of the primacy of the law of natural decline 
um, in this form, um, and in the form that was formulated um, by Grant, came from American um, historical demographer Alan Sharlan, who was unwilling to accept that urban populations in early modern Europe would have inevitably declined without immigration. Sharlan, to some extent, turned the argument on its head by focusing on the migrants. He argued that city populations could be divided into two groups, permanent residents and temporary migrants. Among permanent residents, he said, births actually exceeded deaths, while among the temporary migrants, the opposite held. The permanent residents did achieve natural increase, but the temporary migrants made up disproportionately of the young unmarried um, apprentices, servants, and persons of marginal status were restricted, he said, in their capacity to marry and procreate, although they contributed in a significant manner to the death totals recorded in the city registers or um, sources such as the bills of mortality. And as de Vries puts it, um, in Charlin's interpretation, the frequently observed excess of deaths relative to the number of births occurred because of migration rather than being its cause. He's turning it into um, what might be called an independent variable rather than regarding it as a dependent variable in, um, in that mode of analysis. And I'll come back to that point because it's very central, I think, to some of the developments that are occurring in um, new work on um, um, environments such as London today. And another contributor to this debate was the Dutch um, economic demographic historian, Ad van der Waude, um, in the early 1980s, who was also unwilling to accept the inevitability or what they call universality of urban death as always exceeding um, urban birth, since he wished to argue that in most European cities, by the time we get to the early 19th century, um, there were clear signs that births were beginning to exceed deaths. Um, that is long before major campaigns of public health were bringing down urban death rates. Now, of course, the difficulty um, confronting all of these um, positions was that the sophistication of the demographic measurements used in these debates um, was restricted in part because the tool of nominative linkage using family constitution of parish registers that was pushing the analysis of demographic processes to higher and higher levels of sophistication when applied to villages and small market towns were generally very hard to take to the highly mobile populations um, inhabiting um, towns, where accurate recording of vital events could also be compromised. Nonetheless, use of what we call the rudimentary methods that exploit demographic aggregates in the style of Grant can reveal some starting um, results. In 1981, Tony Wrigley, now joined by his colleague Roger Schofield, was in a position to place some firmer estimates around the London um, baptismal and burial totals and their relationship to those um, baptisms and burials in the whole of England. They estimated that from being just under 3% of all baptisms, those in London rose to marginally more than 12%, um, a fourfold increase by the end of the 17th century. And from just, under, uh, just over 5%, London burials were up to 17% of all those occurring in England in the early 18th century. In fact, baptisms always exceeded burials um, outside, of, outside of London and indeed almost for the whole period, apart from a short interval. The, the boxes capture the deficit of, um, uh, of burials relative to... Or, baptisms relative to burials in London. The um, underlying structure is that for the whole country. And you can see that, um, um, particularly in the period in which Grant was writing at the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the third quarter of the 17th century, in the final quarter, in the early parts of the 18th century, um, those deficits that um, the London population was experiencing drag down the national population um, so that it actually declines, or it helps to contribute to this um, um, decline of the um, national population. We've got other things happening, migration to um, the Caribbean, North America, Ireland, um, and the like. 
But De Vries comments on this um, particular graph. Um, he says, with respect to these data, that they are insufficient, insufficient to fully reject Charlin's thesis, since it's theoretically possible that the London um, age distribution and celibacy rates were so structured as to generate baptism totals well below burial totals, thereby creating what is effectively a mirage of excess mortality. However, to do that, I think, the assumptions would have to be very extreme. Um, there would have to be a very youthful population and a very, very heavy concentration of all those deaths exclusively within the very youngest age groups. And we know from other um, evidence that the London population is not especially youthful by the standards of pre-industrial populations. It tends to have a, a rather um, large um, belly in its middle of um, people aged 15 to 30. And um, the very young are um, significantly less frequently um, found relatively to those in the countryside. So I, I think de Vries's observation there um, is, um, I think, ill-founded. But data in this form also suggest that the circumstances of the late 17th century, the period when Grant is, is putting his ideas together, and the early 18th century, are not necessarily typical of the whole, of the whole sort of sweep of time. Um, the um, the um, Deficits are much, much smaller in the late 16th, early 17th century. And by the time we get to the period after 1750, those big deficits that are characteristic of the late 17th, early 18th century have, 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 have diminished. And by the time you get to the early 19th century, you're starting to get a surplus of, um, of births over deaths. Um, Paquet, if you like, ad van der Waard. In chapter 12 of the observations, Grant writes... When I consider that in the country, 70 are born for 58 buried, and that before the year 1600, the like happened in London. In other words, what he's observing in the late 17th century, he's saying, is not what was there in the late 16th, early 17th century. I considered whether a city, as it becomes more populous, doth not, for that very cause, become more unhealthful. I'm inclined to believe that London now is more unhealthful than heretofore. Partly for, what, for, for that it is more populous, but chiefly because I've heard that um, 60 years ago few sea coals were burnt in London, which is now universally used. I, I'm afraid that the, um, the, the preoccupation with sea coals um, um, is a complicated one, and if you're interested in the sort of panegyric that um, John Evelyn wrote in Fumi Fugium um, um, about the... Um, the effect of sea coal and smoke diminishing the grandeur of the newly re-established Charles II. You can see why, why sea coals were getting a pretty bad press at the time that Grant was composing his ideas. But, um, and I'm sure um, for someone like Tony Wrigley, the idea that sea coals could ha have this sort of adverse effect on any um, sort of aspect of um, English social and economic development um, um, is anathema. But um, that is a, that's, a, that's a private remark, you might say. Well, in raising the possible contrast between London at the end of... Ed Elizabeth I's reign and the situation in the early years of the Restoration, Grant introduces another dimension uh, to the discussion concerning the nature of London's demographic regime, and in particular, um, the trends of mortality. And presenting the issues in admittedly oversimplified terms, it's necessary really to ask whether the notion of demographic sink and natural decline is effectively a constant with regard to large urban centres. In this respect, some of the most penetrating recent work in historical demography as a whole has been directed to considerations of London's mortality within the framework of the notion of an epidemiological regime. I'm talking about um, work in this country. Now, John Landers, who I don't know if he's here, is he? No. Um, has been at the forefront of this work and from an empirical perspective in particular has done so by making use of the bills of mortality in the 18th century, as well as undertaking um, a reconstruction, a family reconstitution of the London Quaker populations from the middle of the 17th century to the early part of the 19th century. And while he doesn't interrogate the same data sets that were central to Grant's work in the observations, he does bring into play a conceptual framework of analysis that helps us to understand the mortality patterns that were emerging and captured by Grant, as well as those that were to follow in the subsequent century and a half after around 1660. 
Now, Landers was much influenced by ideas that were formulated initially by what we call a world historian, W.H. McNeil, who write, writes everything on a remarkably grand plane, particularly a paper that he published in 1980 in a relatively obscure collection, developing more fully his arguments um, seeded initially in his remarkably successful and widely read book, Plagues and Peoples, that came out in 1977. Now, these arguments give particular attention to the spatial structurings of society and their relative impacts on levels of exposure to infection. So this is really the, the, the buzz term, exposure to infection, that comes into, the, um, I think, the, um, the analytical literature. Although such factors as population density and migration flows over a range of geographical scales are also very important. So to put it mildly, or to put it simply rather, um, I'm not sure whether it's mildly, but um, that's a large metropolitan centres in the pre-industrial, pre-transitional, I'm using that in a demographic transitional sense, appear especially amenable to interpretations within this sort of framework. In such settings, densely settled, uh, densely distributed populations residing in poor housing, with poor sanitation, and dependent upon polluted water supplies, created what Landers has termed conditions where pathogens can be retained and conducted. These, these terms are, are, are fairly technical, but I, I, and I, I won't um, linger over them. In addition, the lo location of such centers within dense networks of trade and migration created what's called a high exposure potential to such an extent that they functioned as endemic reservoirs of infection. And as these centers grew, mortality became correspondingly severer. But it did so by impacting adversely on infants and very young adults disproportionately. Those who survived the hazards of life in the youngest age groups entered later life with substantial immunological protection. So you've got different sorts of um, outcomes depending on prior exposure or lack of. Now, Land, as I said, terms this configuration a high potential model of metropolitan mortality. And while mortality in such a setting will be high, it will not be distinguished by great volatility from year to year. Unlike communities in the rural hinterlands, where mortality will be low, but will be punctuated by irregular, uh, severe um, 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 bursts of mortality and then um, falling off again. This would be the difference between town and country. However, those residing in the city will be distinguished by differing levels of immunological protection according to their age and, in particular, their migration history. Children, whether native-born or recent immigrants to the city, will experience high mortality since they lack immunity to infections as as, uh, well, um, as well a high proportion of recent migrants, since they, um, in that respect, will be lacking in immunity similar to the very youngest. So adolescents and young adults who've been born in the city will also have acquired immunity, as will though in the very oldest age groups. But the model here does depend very heavily on the sizable presence of crowd diseases, such as smallpox, measles and other respiratory infections that are distinguished by person-to-person -person modes of transmission. And don't forget, um, we're moving into um, um, a kind of epidemiological environment after 1665 where plague no longer is a contributor to um, death patterns in London. And Landers provided some very persuasive evidence from his studies of the Quakers and use of evidence in the bills of mortality to show that in the early 18th century, um, while infant and young child mortality attained an exceptionally high level, um, compared with levels substantially um, uh, below 200 per thousand in rural areas, by the time we get into the early 19th century, infant mortality levels in London are in the order of 350, approaching 400 per thousand, exceptionally high um, by the standards of, of um, places outside of London, where, um, in general, you can find communities where the rates are down as low as 100, 150 per thousand. But what we see, and this is not a figure from Landers, but it's a figure from an article by Paul Axton 
Williams, um, plotting the um, um, estimated infant mortality rates with a spread around the individual years based upon the bills of mortality from the late 1720s onwards. Um, when we're looking at the situation um, in the early 18th century, um, we're up with very, very high levels of mortality, but then a dramatic decline in infant mortality over the course of the 18th century before um, a more stable situation begins to assert itself, possibly with a, sh a small rise in um, the second quarter of the 19th century. And if you, um, you can see this in a slightly different context, if you look at um, 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 the infant mortality rates in London coming down, um, York, another example, but then not so much happening, relatively speaking, in the countryside. This decline in infant mortality um, seems to occur alongside um, a very sharp fall in the levels of maternal mortality, and it's concentrated amongst infants, especially amongst the newborn first month infants, not so characteristic of children in the later year of life. Now, migration assumes a major role in this account although evidence bearing directly on the issue is not available to Landers. What he does, however, is to assume that most migrants to London were adolescents and young adults, and gains confidence in that assumption because he found that smallpox was the only disease reported in London bills strongly located as a cause of death among children and um, the age groups within which mi recent migrants were most likely to be found. And he also found when he did his nominative analysis of the, of the Quakers that those dying of smallpox over the age of 10 left no record of them having been born in London. They had to have come in, so to speak, to die rather than being born within the population. Now, since Landers published his ideas in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there's been piecemeal work. Um, some of the authors here, I hope they won't take it too um, unkindly if I call it piecemeal, but it's, it, it's piecemeal still. Very, 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 um, very restricted, but very, very, I think, um, pregnant with meaning. Um, just going back. Some work done by Jill Newton and myself on infant mortality in both city and suburban parishes in London before 1700 has shown that there was a clear this, and that there are other authors work here too, but I don't have time to go through all of it. But if you look at these infant mortality uh, rates, um, they're quite widely spread over um, um, a more modest range in the early 17th century, but are drifting up steadily. So by the time you get um, into the late 17th, early 18th century, um, there are many places, including the London Quakers um, and um, um, relatively well-off parts of the city in um, um, Cheapside, and poorer suburban growth areas like Clerkenwell and Allgate. They've all drifted up to be um, in the order of 300, 300,000 plus. So there's no doubt that there is a significant worsening of the life chances of infants over the course of the 17th century. And it's happening in, in rich and poor areas. It's not peculiar to, um, I think, any environment which is um, distinguished by um, low living standards. And the same would apply if you looked at the drift upwards of um, mortality rates for children. That's the, um, the one to four age group. Well, as I said, the bills of mortality reveal sharp falls in infant and maternal mortality over the course of the latter half of the 18th century. And this too seems to be something that can be found across a reasonably broad spectrum of London society those in workhouses, those infants taken into the London Foundling Hospital, and indeed the work of um, Romola Davenport, Jeremy Bolton, about which we'll hear more, and their colleague Leonard Swartz, they've argued, based in their recent, I think, and ongoing research on the large and rapidly growing parish of St. Martin in the fields, that these improvements were relatively egalitarian, I think is a the phrase they've used. Um, in their effects, and that they are of an epidemiological type rather than specifically associated with the rise in the standard of living. Of course, this doesn't rule out 
um, a role for smallpox vaccination in significantly assisting um, in this shift. Now, in certain respects, in this argument as a whole, migration, unlike in Grant's specification of the issue, I don't think can be regarded um, as um, a dependent variable any longer, in part responding to the shortfall of baptisms relative to burials. But to a certain extent, it becomes an independent variable, with so much hinging on the age incidence and the immunological status of those entering the metropolitan population from outside. In effect, it's a mortality variant of the argument that Charlin introduced over 30 years ago, when he was privileging fertility attributes of migrants as the driving factor in determining the character of the demographic regime prevailing in large urban centers. And it could be hypothesized, as indeed have Romola Davenport, Dennis Schwartz, and Jeremy Bolton, um, um, in an unpublished paper, which they might refer to, I don't know, but um, I like it, so I'm going to refer to it, um, that there was um, a migrant selectivity effect that was driving down the mortality risk with migrants to urban areas making up a selected population of healthy, low mortality risk individuals. And in a very recently published paper that came out in the Economic History Review last year, in which they make um, use of the extremely valuable information in the Sexton books of St. Martin's in the Fields, these authors identify a sharp reduction in smallpox fatalities among adults after 1770. Consistent, they argue, with a sudden increase in exposure um, in rural areas brought about by what I think they, um, um, they suggest was um, a rise in the infectiousness of the smallpox virus, which made those who had survived then migrating into London um, arriving with far lower risks in their life chances. Um, so again, um, the great difficulty with all of these um, sorts of arguments, intellectually um, attractive though they might be, is that we still don't know who the migrants are, um, because that's the last piece of information you get from the kind of data sets that um, we're working um, with. And these issues are still thinly researched, in part because of the relative difficulty of finding demographic data that enables the simultaneous study of mortality changes by age, along with evidence bearing upon the cause of death, as well as knowledge of the um, um, migration histories of the individuals concerned. However, these changes seem clearly implicated in what I'd like to claim is a major, indeed, one might claim also to be revolutionary shift in the epidemiological environment in London and other urban centres, since there is evidence that not just in London, um, but other urban centres in England and probably elsewhere in northwestern Europe, an urban demographic transition was getting underway after 1770, with urban mortality rates falling below urban fertility rates. Um, you can see um, the um, data on births and deaths for London that um, when we get to the, um, the period in which Grant is writing is the period when, in a sense, the gap between births and deaths is almost at its maximum, or, or approaching its maximum. By the time we get to the last third of the 18th century, we're moving into an environment where births are beginning to exceed deaths in London. Um, a similar sort of picture um, can be seen for um, a city like York in the 18th century, and we could point to um, a good deal many more. Now, Jan de Vries noted that until this transition is established on a permanent basis, urban growth depends almost entirely on migration. It's a kind of crossing point, um, this, um, this moment in the late 18th century, that must be passed to remove a ceiling on overall urban growth. And de Vries reminds us that until this point is reached, and he um, employs simulation exercises that were undertaken by the mathematical demographer Nathan Kaifitz in the 1980s uh, to show this. Until this point is reached, the urban sector 
is unable to surpass a maximum of 40%. You just can't get above that kind of proportion. Um, and when you move through that crossing point, the world changes. And the implications for economic growth and a whole array of issues to do with, with development, I think, change their nature greatly. And it can be claimed that understanding the, um, I would say, the epidemiological underpinning of the shift from the world that was described so precociously by John Grant in his observations upon the bills of mortality to the one that is being unearthed in this more recent work on the mortality regimes of large urban centres constitutes one of the most pressing tasks requiring the attention of historical demographers or those who might be more, I suppose, appropriately described as historical epidemiologists. Thank you. <laughs>